resort to my mobile device here. Sorry about that. That's okay. So anyway, we're right on time. We said we were going to kick things off at 1230. So now that we have Andrew online and it looks like we've started to have everyone else dialing in, uh, we can kick off um, for our lab this month that we have our guest speaker, Andrew, while on the phone, we were talking about expenses as that time of the year well we're a little bit past april 30th but um you know kicking off the new the new tax year or whenever your incorporated tax year is um looking at expenses so we wanted to touch on a few things um the first being which expenses are fully deductible and which ones are partially deductible so yeah there's a couple of categories that are partially deductible um the most notable being your home office and your automobile so obviously we take a percentage of use uh, for each of these as we're using the business use uh, compared to the total use. So with automobile expense, we'll, we'll start with that one because it's a little bit unique in that in addition to being percentage of use, there's actually two methods of calculating your automobile expense. You can either use the mileage rate or you can use the actual expenses. If you're using the mileage rate, then the percentage of use becomes less applicable because you're just taking the business kilometers that you're driving and multiply that by the rates that are prescribed by CRA. When you use the actual expenses, then you take a percentage of all of those actual, actual expenses as calculated by um, dividing the business kilometers by the total kilometers that you've driven and that gives you a percentage. And that's the percentage that you take of all your relevant uh, automobile expenses, whether that be uh, amortization if you own a vehicle, or lease if you're leasing the vehicle. So and is there a, which would be the better way that, like, or is it just really dependent on each other, each person's specific um, situation? It depends on your situation because if you're driving a lot of uh, kilometers, then the kilometer method will probably be best. Uh, if you don't drive a lot of kilometers and you've recently purchased a car, uh, you might find that the actual is better. And one of the most important things that you should do is you should actually calculate both. Um, that's what we do for every one of our clients. We calculate uh, both methods to see which one is, is the optimum. And you're allowed to switch back and forth between either method to make sure that you're getting the maximum deduction. And so you can switch back and forth every, every year, depending on which better for you. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. And uh, so what about the home office? So the home office is, again, another percentage of use calculation. Um, how we calculate the percentage of use for our clients is a little bit different than the average. There's a number of ways that you can calculate percentage of use for your home office expense. You can either use um, the number of rooms uh, or you can use square footage. Um, so number of rooms would just be um, number of office spaces that you have, usually one divided by total rooms in the house. Um, but for percentage of use, which we use, um, we do a bit of a unique calculation. Most people will just take the square footage of the office, um, which does need to be a dedicated workspace, and divide it by the total square footage of the house. Um, but what we do, which is a little bit different, is we take into account the storage space and the parking space, uh, because those are obviously used to store business documents and to store the vehicle, which is used for business use. Um, and we also take into account the common areas. And so in our calculation, what we do is we take the office space plus the parking and divide that by, by the total uh, square footage of the house plus the parking because we've included that in the numerator. But we take out the common areas, which are the kitchens, the hallways, and the bathrooms. And by making that subtle distinction in how we do the calculation, we typically take someone who's maybe you know 10 or 15% to 25 to 30 percent of their home office which as you can imagine with you know most people who have um, mortgage interests in the tens of thousands of dollars and uh, property taxes which are several thousand dollars a small difference in the percentage makes a big difference in the amount of deduction that you're going to have at the end of the year um, so that's one of the things to keep in mind about the home office the other thing to keep in mind is the maximum percentage that we would recommend. Um, if you own the property and you go above 30%, um, the risk is that you're now using the home office for more than ancillary use. And you could be potentially looking at um, an implication on your capital gains exemption of your primary residence. Now, if you're renting, this is a, a non-issue. Um, so it's nothing to be 
concerned about. But if you do own the property, we typically recommend that you stay below 30%. Um, now, that's not set in stone, and you're not going to find that number in the Income Tax Act anywhere. It's a general guideline that we've come up with over the years. Okay. And so not everyone on the call is an incorporated entity. Some people may be temp employees that work, and obviously as consultants, um, they're operating a business out of their primary business out of their home, but they're maybe working at a client site and be eligible for a T2200. Is that, does that uh, work any differently? Yes, it, it does. Uh, when you're uh, an employee with a T2200, first of all, you're limited by what aspects of the T2200 have been filled out by your employer. Um, if they haven't actually ticked the box to say you're eligible or you're required to use a home office, you can't claim it. Secondly, when you're um, an employee or if you're uh, a sole proprietor, the requirements for a home office are a little bit different than when you're self-employed. When you're self-employed, it just has to be a space available for you to use. Or sorry, when you're incorporated, it has to be a space that's available for you to use. When you're self-employed or on a T2200, it has to be a primary place of business. Um, and particularly with the T2200, it has to be required by your employer. Um, so there are some differences as far as eligibility, as, as far as whether you can actually even deduct the home office calculation. Um, so that's something very important to consider. It's something that's often overlooked, um, particularly by sole providers. Now, the good news is as far as um, being a primary place of business, um, that's largely dictated by having meetings there. And now meetings like Blab and virtual meetings and go-to meetings um, and phone calls are now being accepted as valid forms of meeting. And that's thanks to the real estate agents out there um, who have fought and won several cases on this topic. Okay. So really in terms of if you're a sole proprietor or you're a temp employee, it's well, as a temp employee ensuring that you get your T2200 signed off or else you're not really able to deduct these expenses. Absolutely. So uh, it's really important to um, have the T2200 signed off by your employer and the amount of rain as far as what you can and can't deduct is 100% dictated by what boxes that they have ticked for you and allowed you to be able to claim. Um, and so this is really comes down to what your um, employer is willing to do and how flexible they are um, and how important it is to them that you're uh, have paying for expenses that they're not going to be reimbursing you for. Okay. Okay. And um, so what would be like reasonable and necessary expenses that one person could expect, whether you're an incorporated primarily an incorporated person, but also, I guess, as a sole proprietor or a temp employee to deduct? Um, well, this is a funny question because um, we have a document that I was going to share with you guys today, despite it, until I have my computer problems. Uh, so I'll, I'll try and get that out uh, through Twitter after the meeting, which is a list of um, expenses that the average person can expect uh, to deduct. But the important thing to note is it's not an exhaustive list. The criteria for a deductible expenses, it can't be specifically disallowed by the Income Tax Act, first and foremost. Um, and there are things that are specifically dis disallowed, things like your golf green fees, club memberships, life insurance, home telephone line. Um, outside of those items that are specifically disallowed, the criteria is that it has to be spent with the intent of helping your business earn income sometime in the future. And it has to be reasonable both reasonable and sometime in the future, these are obviously very vague terms that are subjective and open to interpretation. And that's where a good accountant is going to come in and help you maximize your interpretation of these deductions. And your role um, as an independent contractor is to interpret these deductions as aggressively as you possibly can without obviously crossing any lines or doing anything fraudulent. But the reality is you as the business owner have the most knowledge about whether these expenses are really going to help your business earn income and have the ability to, to help your business grow. Now, an auditor might have an interpretation of that, but it's just that. It's, it's an interpretation. And there is a whole um, review process that you have with CRA or an appeals process that if an auditor, if you happen to be audited, which is um, hopefully not going to happen, but if you happen to be audited, then you have an appeals process and you actually have three levels of appeals within CRA itself to go through and argue the merits of your case. 
And CRA is certainly going to argue the merits of their case, and it's your job to convince them why these expenses have merit and are therefore legitimately deductible. And again, a good accountant is really going to help you um, with that because they're going to have experience with the various categories and know how to use the right language to make sure that you're entitled to keep those deductions. Now, God forbid an auditor still disagrees with you all through all three levels of appeals, you still have the possibility of going to tax court, uh, federal court of appeals, and even the Supreme Court of Canada. Obviously, you're not going to do that for you know a hundred dollar advertising deduction, but if you've got something significant like what we talked about before, personal service business issues, um, where the implications are significant, uh, you may choose to go further through the uh, court system to fight with that and ensure that you get everything that we believe you're entitled to. Okay. And then there was, you know, one of the things was uh, contact specific deductions that we had talked about where, you know, money spent on clothing is deductible if it's, you know, a certain, you know, if it's deemed for a business. So if you're buying suits, is that considered a deduction that you're able to take as a consultant? Um, you know, it, like what are those um, contact specific expenses that may or may not, you know, get you into trouble if you're, if you're trying to deduct those? Right. So obviously, um, reasonableness is where that comes into play as far as whether that expense is reasonable for your industry, which is somewhat subjective. Now, when we talk specifically about business clothing, we look at the jurisprudence for this um, or the case history and the tax law that, that has uh, taken place in the past. And there was a period of time where we were actually, um, we were very liberal in deducting of business clothing. Um, and we'd had some court cases that have been fought and won in, in favor of independent uh, contractors being able to deduct their business clothing. Um, unfortunately, in the recent past, there's been cases around business clothing that have made it virtually or very difficult to deduct. It's not specifically disallowed by the Income Tax Act. So you certainly can deduct it and argue the merits for your case. But what I can tell you is that CRA is probably, if they, if they review it in an audit, probably going to disallow it because they now have this case history to go on. Um, and the case history was actually a lawyer um, who had been deducting his suits, which for us had been a slam dunk win. We, you know, this was part of your professional image, your personal grooming, your suits um, were something that we had um, been able to win uh, case after case and be able to deduct those for our clients for years. Um, but unfortunately, after getting that precedence where the lawyer had claimed his suits um, and, and been fairly aggressive in his claim, it wasn't just, you know, a thousand dollars worth of suits. We're talking, you know, very expensive suits and, and several of them. And the expression we have around here, pigs get fat, but hogs get slaughtered. Um, and effectively, he was made an example of. And the problem was that that's created case law or jurisprudence that CRA now can use against any other independent contractor. Um, so, well, it's not impossible to claim your business clothing. Uh, it's probably not recommended. Okay. So other things that you brought up personal grooming, so like haircuts and that other things that go along with that, that would fall in the same bucket. That would generally fall in the same bucket. Um, you know, we uh, are more liberal with things like um, dry cleaning because it's very specific Like you're paying for the dry cleaning to wear to that specific interview or that specific client meeting. Um, so we tend to be a little bit more flexible on that. But again, this is really what we call gray area expenses where there's no, definitive answer um, and I think the other thing that is um, important to talk about is the type of business that you're in and, and how that is going to change what becomes reasonable um, you know um, I think one of the things we talked about earlier when he was um, you know if you're an artist deducting oil and uh, canvases is obviously perfectly reasonable but if you're an IT consultant doing this as a pastime and as a hobby it's reasonableness to whether it's going to help your business to earn income is uh, obviously far less reasonable and therefore probably wouldn't be deductible. Um, so what we encourage everyone to do is um, deduct everything that you possibly can. If you're unsure of everything, put it under a general expense category. And then what we do for our clients is we run a benchmarking analysis and show you how you compare to the average and the median within our database specific to the independent consulting industry. So we can see areas where um, there's red flags for either opportunities, you've, you've missed out on deductions that the average person is taking, 
or there's red flags because you're being more aggressive than the average. And being more aggressive than the average doesn't mean you're not entitled to that deduction. It just simply means, you know, our system has red flagged you. High probability CRA system might red flag you. So let's, you know, dot our I's and cross our T's and make sure that we have all the documentation in place so that if Revenue come, Canada comes knocking at our door, we can explain and argue the merits of our case. And if you are well prepared and well documented, uh, that usually sends CRA packet. Now, if you're not prepared and you're not able to answer their questions, I guarantee you they're going to dig deeper. Okay, that's fair enough. So on the on some of those reasonable expenses as a T, like just because we've kind of touched on the T2200 and sole proprietors, are, are those things even up for possible conversation for those people like a T2200, anything to do with your personal grooming, your dry cleaning, uh, anything like that? Yeah, well, they're, they're, they do have sort of advertising and, and promotional type of expenses as one option that, that can be ticked. Home office, cell phone. Um, there's actually quite a bit of flexibility that you can have with the T2200 if it's filled out um, in a way that gives you that flexibility. Like I say, it really comes down to what boxes are ticked um, by your employer. Assuming that they've given you full leeway, then yes, you're going to have some flexibility on meals and entertainment. You're going to have some flexibilities on home office. You're going to have some flexibilities on automobile. You're going to have flexibilities on having an assistant or um, uh, someone, uh, a subcontractor or income splitting potentially with your wife or your children who might be helping you with the business. Uh, there's actually quite a bit of flexibility that you can have with a T2200. Um, now, again, a T2200 um is uh, there's different types of people that that get t2200s and one of the things i will mention is obviously commission uh, salespeople because um you know anyone in the recruiting or staffing industry many of them are base plus commission and if you get a t2200 for your commission sales one of the things to understand is that you are limited uh your deductions are limited to the extent of your commission sales so you might have you know let's say a hundred thousand dollars of um, base and fifty thousand dollars of commission. If you're a great recruiter, um, you can only take your deductions up to the fifty thousand dollars, not not beyond that. Okay, okay. And so even if you, so if you get a T twenty two hundred because you have a home office and you have um, um, automobile expenses, it's just confined to that. Now, what if it's like a bonus or uh, or it's all base? Yeah, if it's all base, you're not going to be like talking about commission salespeople. If it's all base, you're 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 very limited in, in what you can and can't do. Um, there's very specific people who are eligible for the T2200 and what deductions they can and that cannot claim. Again, if you have any questions about that, I encourage you to come in, book a free consultation with us. We'll review your T2200 and tell you what kind of flexibility that you do have within that document. Because um, you'll hear me this, say this every time, Wendy, and I, I do apologize. Everyone's situation is different. And it really yep. comes down to, to what it is that you are actually doing. Like, are you a commission sales employee? Are you an independent contractor who's working on a temp employment contract? Are you a sole proprietor? Um, these are going to affect what you can and cannot deduct. Okay, fair enough. Um, and what about itemizing deductions? Should that be when someone's coming in to meet with you, should they have already itemized their deductions appropriately or just drop off a box? Or how does that well, uh, We'll take a shoebox. It's uh, preferred to have the information um, categorized. And um, I'm a big proponent of cloud-based technologies. Um, and there's great technology out there now to really simplify this process. QuickBooks Online and Zero are excellent tools for sucking in your bank statement and your credit card and helping you to automatically classify those and eliminate a lot of the data entry. But of course, if a client wants to you know, throw his hands up in the air and say, here's my shoebox, we're more than happy to take that on. But there's obviously a significantly higher cost associated with doing that. Um, and as if we're talking about just an initial consultation, um, certainly we can, we can start by talking at a high level without having any of that information, but the more financial information we have at hand, the better we can provide insight. Okay. So it, it, an Excel spreadsheet as some sort of software program, something like that definitely helps provide some guidance. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, and, and I do encourage everyone to, um, use some sort of tool. I, I don't care what tool it is, but to do it on a regular basis. I think what we find in our industry is that many people leave it till the end of the year. You know, it's not something that they enjoy doing. And so often that gets 
procrastinated on and left to the very last minute, sometimes beyond the last minute, truthfully. Um, so using tools and technology and doing it on a regular basis makes it a smaller, more approachable task. You know, if we can break this into bite-sized pieces, it's a lot easier to digest than trying to, you know, eat the horse in one bite. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so you somewhat touched on non-deductible expenses. Um, what types of expenses outside of you? You mentioned green fees, um, home telephone, um, that type of things. What, what are things that people should steer away from? Well, those are the big ones that are that are specifically disallowed by the Income Tax Act. Um, outside of those items that I mentioned, really, you do have complete flexibility. I, I will. Um, the tip I always give people who are avid golfers and want to um, claim their, their golf green fees because they're doing a lot of business. Unfortunately, there's absolutely no way you can claim the green fees. But what you can do is if you're going out with people who are full-time employees, um, have them pick up the green fees and you pick up the 19th hole or the drinks around the course, and those are absolutely uh, deductible. So what you want to do is, is try to um, understand the things that aren't deductible and try and find workarounds like um, picking up lunch as opposed to picking up the green fees. Um, for example, with um, life insurance, which is, is specifically disallowed, some of the things you can do is you can set up the corporation as the beneficiary of the life insurance. And well, it won't be a deductible expense, what that does is allows you to pay for um, the insurance with money that is pre-tax dollars, i.e. Uh, money that's taxed at the corporate tax rate, rather than you having to take the money out, draw it into personal salary, pay the higher personal tax rate, and then pay for the expense. Um, so there's little things that you can do. You know, you talk about your home telephone line, that's specifically disallowed, but cell phones, VoIP lines aren't. So there's ways around um, these deductions so that you can maximize um, the tax deductions and minimize the amount of money that you're actually spending to get the best bang for your buck. Okay. Okay. So we have a question here. If I have to move to start a new contract, what moving expenses would be considered non-deductible? Well, uh, it, it depends on how far you're moving and whether you're required to move uh, for the contract. Um, those types of things, um, you get quite a bit of flexibility on um, as an individual. So if you're required to move, you can actually put these straight onto your personal tax return. Um, items that are not um, allowed on your personal tax return, then it just comes into whether it's reasonable and will help your business earn income. Um, and again, really vague and really subjective. So you could probably deduct most of the expenses related to that. Um, it, one of the things that as far as deducting it on your personal um, tax return, if you are incorporated, is uh, the criteria is you've got to be moving closer uh, to your work um, in order to claim it on your personal tax return. Um, and if you're self-employed, uh, your work is your home office. So you're probably not moving any closer. Um, so it won't be a deductible necessarily on the personal tax return if you're incorporated. Um, it would be for a sole proprietorship or um, someone on a, say, T2200. Okay. Um, so... so is there, is there any other tax tips that you can give or expense tips that you can give, Andrew, that uh, people would find beneficial as we start out? I guess not really a new tax year for those people who have a calendar year, but, you know, as we finish off, everyone hopefully filing their taxes um, yeah. yesterday. The number one tip I would say is track every dollar you spend. You know, cash is a four letter word. Uh, we don't like to use it in accounting firms. So put everything on a debit and a credit card track every dollar that you spend because the biggest tip I can give you is that uh, there's a lot of deductions that are wasted because people think of them as small and consequential over the course of the year that they add up quite significantly. Um, you know, so making sure that you're tracking everything and if you're unsure whether you can or you can't deduct it, put it under a general expense or an ask my accountant category so that you can review that with them. Um, and that's probably the key to making sure that you're getting the most bang for your buck is starting by actually capturing the expenses. Because if you haven't captured it, for me to be able to identify that after the fact is very, very difficult. Okay. So when you're meeting with people just as a, a general consultation, if I'm just starting, you know, obviously 
you know, even with, I think most banks now, you know, everything that comes in on your visa card, they, they've somewhat categorized for you. Is that just mm -hmm. a generally good starting point for some people to take a look and then go from there or? It's better than nothing. Uh, <laughs> I would, you know, uh, it, that's going to be high level. I wouldn't trust that the way that they're coding or classifying things. Um, and, and in addition, they're probably not going to do that for your bank statement, right? They're, they'll do that for credit cards usually only. Um, so what you really want to do is, is, is get into one of these cloud-based tools that can help do a lot of that classification for you automatically. You know, there are free ones out there as well if, if cost is an issue. Uh, Wave Accounting out of Toronto has has a free version that you can use. It is limited. There's a reason it, it's free. And sorry if anyone from Wave is listening. Um, so there, there are benefits to moving to the paid ones. Uh, that is, I, I really strongly encourage people to use some of that tools and technology out there um, to be able to start capturing that information because that's going to make a big difference um, in your bottom line because I, I can't tell you how many times I've sat down with someone and, and gone through the discussion and helped pinpoint things to our benchmark that they might have been able to deduct, but they haven't kept the receipt or they've lost it and you know, now, you know, claiming that deduction is a much, much higher risk, if even possible at all. Okay. So for things like, it, I mean, again, I think receipts get lost, but if you've used your, your visa card, is that sometimes that line item on your visa acceptable? Uh, the funny thing is, no, it's not. Uh, your visa statement is not considered a valid source document. You are required to keep the transactional information. However, it comes up to the discretion of the auditor. Um, the reason that it's not considered a valid source document is one, it doesn't have HST information on it. Um, two, it doesn't have line item detail. So you can imagine if you went to the bay and you spent a thousand dollars, it could be spent on virtually anything. It could be legitimately business related. It could be personal. It's hard to say. Now, if you go to ESSO and you spend uh, $40, it's probably pretty reasonable guess that that was legitimately for gas and therefore deductible but it it's within the auditor's discretion and if, okay. if they wanted to disallow these fuel expenses because you don't have the supporting documentation it's well within their right to do so so uh, it's really important to keep the supporting documentation and the best tool in the world um, for bookkeeping is a smartphone it's really easy to just snap a picture of your receipts and save it whether you use again there's third-party tools that can ocr these transactions and put them into the uh, cloud-based technology, but even if all you did was just take a picture and save it on your computer, um, that's a great way or a great reference point to go back if you need it. Now, as your accountant, I don't need that source documentation to do the accounting. You need that if you're auditing. Okay. Okay. So is there a tool that's like, uh, that you can recommend um, that would be good? And I, I guess on top of that, you know, based on the fact that it's an expense for your business, I'm assuming it's, uh, even though there's a cost to it, you can write that off as part of your operating your business. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's deductible. And there are a number of great tools out there. Um, there's a really good one that I like that actually um, integrates with FlexTrack. Um, it's called HubDoc. And uh, one of the, uh, there's two owners, it's a Toronto based company. Uh, and one of the owners actually was a consultant through program at one of the major banks. So uh, he helped build an integration to be able to go and um, pull um, even your, um, your invoices uh, to uh, Procom and uh, allow those to come in and feed automatically into your accounting software. It'll also uh, go out and fetch um, PDFs of your bank statements or any online statements that you're receiving, whether it be from, you know, say Best Buy or Amazon or any of those statements, it'll pull the physical PDF, the supporting documentation that we talked about that you need, pull those from the online resources and store them in their document repository. Plus, if necessary, push them out to things like, um, you know, box.com or um, QuickBooks Online or Zero or any of these uh, other third party tools. Um, and it'll give you not only the PDF, the physical documentation, but OCR it and take the data from this physical document and create a transaction from them. And of course, like most of the other tools out there, there are a couple of them. They'll also give you an iPhone app or an Android app that allows you to take a picture um, and OCR that uh, receipt uh, for things like 
you know, going out for a meal or a restaurant, you can just take a picture of it, they'll OCR it, create the transaction, put both the physical supporting image as well as the transaction into your accounting software. So HubDoc's a great one. Um, there's another one, Receipt Bank. It doesn't do that fetching that we talked about, um, but it, it, it does do OCRing and give you the image. There's Expensify. There's actually quite a few of these. Uh, top pick would, would probably be HubDoc, and then second to the top would be Receipt Bank. Okay, great. So we just have another question. It says, do I need to get an itemized receipts every time? And what, yes. I think what you're saying is yes, like yeah. every time you need to be getting this. Absolutely. Um, now, like I say, you may never be audited and never be asked for that itemized receipt. And so you can certainly do your bookkeeping and your accounting from the high level transactional information from your credit card or bank card. But if you happen to be audited um, and you're asked for that line item and you can't produce it, they're within the rights to disallow that expense. Okay. And we have another question. It says, if you use your car for personal and business use, how do you deduct it? So as we talked about, this is probably someone to dial in a little bit later. Um, it would be a percentage of use. So if you're using the mileage method, you just take your, your mileage that you've driven for business use and you calculate that by the prescribed rates by CRA. If you're um, using a percentage of the actual, then you take business kilometers divided by total kilometers. That gives you a percentage. You multiply that by your fuel, by your um, um, either lease or amortization, by your insurance, by all the costs associated with that motor vehicle. Um, one other little tip I will give about the automobile expense is that if you take your parking and put that under um, travel rather than automobile, you'll get 100% of that parking expense rather than a percentage. So typically, people want to separate out their parking costs from the other costs associated with their automobile. Okay, that's great. Um, one more question that came in is for cell phone expenses. I mean, I think some people have, you know, two cell phone expense, two cell phones, one for business, one for personal. A lot of people, though, obviously try to get down to one device. So do you need to break out personal versus business? Can you write it all off? No, and I know that there's certainly more conservative accountants out there who will tell you, oh, you can only take the business use of it and you need to figure out business versus uh, personal uh, we don't subscribe to that theory. Uh, in this day and age, you need to be available to your clients and to uh, recruiters to help you find next opportunities. So just having the, the cell phone available is a legitimate business expense and you can take 100% of it. So all of our clients take 100% of their cell phone as well as their internet. We do not calculate um, a personal use. Now you might find a more conservative accountant. And again, it's not going to be defined in the Income Tax Act. This comes down to reasonableness. Uh, we have never lost uh, deduction on cell phone or internet. So your home internet, even though you may use it for to run your Netflix, you may use it for um, your everyday personal surfing, but that's totally buying to deduct the whole 100% of that. Exactly. Imagine if you were an employee somewhere and they wanted you to be able to work from home, they would probably pay for your internet and your cell phone so that they could reach you. And they wouldn't only reimburse you for a portion of that, they would pay for the whole thing even if you happen to use it personally. It's paid for by the business because they need you to have access to these tools. Okay, and there's no lid. So, you know, some people might have a small uh, internet account. Other people will have a larger internet account, a larger bill. Like that, there's no there's no difference in that from a CRA perspective. No, no. Um, I mean, potentially you could run into reasonable issues if you have massive, massive bills. I've never yet to in encounter it. Uh, the biggest tip I, I will use pe give people is um, just because something's deductible doesn't mean that you want to be spending more money on it. The objective is always to lower your cost. Um, so doing things, you know, getting locked into plans, if you're going to be roaming, making sure that you've got a roaming plan, using VoIP when and where you can. Um, one of the other things that um, uh, we did recently, because, you know, with all the streaming that's going on these days, the amount of data that you turn up. Uh, on your home internet can go up significantly. So again, a, a tip to keep your cost down is that um, most people, particularly in the Toronto area, are actually, if you're self-employed, eligible for a business line through Rogers rather than a home line. And all business lines have unlimited data, um, which can make a significant difference in your bill at the end of the year. Um, so if you're 
if you've got high internet bills, uh, probably worth having a look at converting over to a business plan uh, rather than a personal plan so that you can have unlimited data. Those are very good tips. Um, so the other, another question that came in was, um, do car repairs factor into claims? Yeah, so you can, you can claim uh, all the repair maintenance that you do on your vehicle. Again, if you're taking the actual expenses, uh, you can multiply that by the percentage of use. If you are using the mileage rate, then you don't take into account any costs that you have. So it's either mileage or actual. If you are using actual, you're going to take your percentage of use and multiply it by all costs, including repairs and maintenance. Okay. And every year, does CRA prescribe what that mileage, um, that mileage rate is? Yeah. So there, there's a prescribed rate. It does change periodically. Um, and uh, there, there's a certain rate for the first 5,000 kilometers, then a different rate for every kilometer thereafter. Um, and those are prescribed by CRA. There's no option on, on, on what they can be. Um, it's prescribed. And so we have a form where you can put in all your information for both the actual costs and then the mileage. And then it shows you quickly which one's going to be better for you. And from a mileage perspective, like how should, how should people be tracking that? And what is CRA, what's the reasonableness of what CRA is going to expect you've done? Like, are you should be keeping a book on this? Is it just like, Generally, I travel 50 kilometers a week for business purposes, times that by 50, 50 weeks of the year, and that's kind of what I do, or do I have to be very specific about when I'm traveling for business and when I'm not? You're supposed to keep a mileage log. CRA does uh, prescribe that you keep a mileage log. Uh, the reality is most people don't. Um, but if you have a calendar where you've kept a list of all your appointments and you can go back and recreate a mileage log if you're audited, that's sufficient. Um, I'm also a big fan of, again, obviously I love my technology and there's great pieces of technology out there to help you track your mileage, whether it's ones as simple as, you know, app for your phone and there's different apps, whether it tracks, you know, from, um, you know, you could just do starting point, ending point, or you can do one that actually GPS is your whole route and calculates it or the ones that I love now, I can't think of the names off the top of my head, but there's ones that actually connect to, I think it's called the OBD connector. Like, you know, that, that uh, part of your engine where, where you get to get serviced is, is reads the computer and you can actually connect it to this and then connect via Bluetooth uh, from your phone and it tracks all your mileage and everything for you. So there's, there's great technology to make this process easier and easier. Um, and I strongly encourage doing a Google search on those. There's, tons out there um but the reality of day-to-day -day life many people don't don't actually keep anything and if they are audited have to go back and re recreate that log um so i encourage everyone to keep a log if you don't mm -hmm. well, there's always solutions to every problem okay so, uh, so one, one of our uh one of our listeners came in and said trip log is a good app to track mileage using gps just for anybody who's interested in it in an app that's out there but someone has verified works for them um so andrew i mean is there anything else that you can uh you know we're at 106 now i think we're scheduled for half an hour so we're already over is there any other tips out there that uh you're you could give people or the number one tip is speak with a professional um and uh make sure that you are working with someone who's um got a little bit of an aggressive attitude obviously as you can tell by our um, my focus here, I'm not your average accountant. Um, our objective is to um, fight for your rights and make sure that you're maximizing your deductions. You know, our role isn't to play the role of CRA, what you can't deduct. It's to push the envelope without crossing the line. Uh, so work with the professional, you know, talk with your community, talk with the people who you sit next to, ask them what types of things that they are deducting, um, what things you may not be aware of. Um, use benchmarking tools to see how you compare to the average and, and the median in your database. Understand where you're at risk and where you're missing out. Um, and those are my, my recommendations. I guess there's a mouthful there. Okay, great. Well, Andrew, once again, obviously great information. And I, I mean, I know people will find this very helpful coming into this new year. And, uh, you know, we look forward to next month and another chat. Sounds good. And like I said, I'll shoot out a tweet in a minute. So for those of you who aren't following me at CA4IT or my Andrew, Twitter I think handle. Okay, great. And we'll also treat, tweet that out on uh, the ProCom site as well.
Charles. Um, so all. Okay, great. Absolutely. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Okay, thanks, the, uh, All right, thanks so much, Andrew. Okay, bye bye. Bye for now.